I thought of our friend, the midge today. Yeah. And I thought of the funniest joke that he ever told me. A young lady walks up with eggs, bread, cheese, milk, and, and people make. So she's got these items and she's there and, and she's ready to check out. And a drunk guy comes stumbling up behind her. He looks at her. He looks at the stuff on the belt now. And she's like, I help you? And the drunk guy goes, you single? She looks at her stuff on the belt. He goes, yes, I am. Why? And the drunk guy says, because you're ugly. <laughs> Welcome to the Bottle of Brown podcast. I'm your host, Danny Paul. Joining me in the Bob Media Studios this week is the Baron of Bourbon himself, the man who puts the O in Ohio. It is the one, the only, Leon Coventry, ladies. (laughs) Danny, they just get better and better. I love these introductions. I love them. I got to give credit where credit is due, sir. How you doing? It's been a while. It has been, and I got my energy back, and I'm and you're in <clears throat> my voice is coming in and out. So I, I apologize to the magic. What forty nine now? Did we make mm-hmm. it to fifty? We're mm-hmm. getting there. Could be more. <clears throat> Ooh, we're getting new bobs every day. But uh, yeah, feeling better. Got my energy back. Ready to drink again. And uh, so I think my tolerance probably went down the shitter. So let's see what happens tonight. All right. All right. Let's see. Let's see how light date. your uh, let's see how light you wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since uh, since the show is going to get interesting around the hour mark again, what are you drinking tonight? What's your brown? I am going with Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, Ooh. and uh, I didn't know this off the the tip of my tongue. I wondered why we had a couple of these, but Triple B, as always, is more knowledgeable than me, and said they all are different because there is no uh, two batches that are the same. So this is batch eighty five twenty one with a 118.2 proof and i gotta tell you it lights you up it's 12 years mm. aged so it's delicious and we all know elijah craig's respectable brand so i wanted to come back guns blazing yep yep and of course we trust triple b friend of the show busty bourbon batch on instagram she is one of our lead followers we're very proud of her so if she recommends it god damn it it's got to be good yep i am uh, continuing my journey back through game of thrones land so we're drinking our johnny walker song of fire themed Ooh. brown and uh, oh, 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 oh. There you go. See, the dragon? see the dragon oh, yeah. tits and dragons is ian McShane, does that have the say. cinnamon this has the Flavor cinnamon. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, a unique blend, of course, aren't they all? We were laughing about this like a couple of years ago. You remember Conan always opens. We got a great show tonight. Like, when is it ever not great, Conan? When is it an average show? <laughs> but sometimes he started to say that, like, it's not good tonight. He's like, I, yeah, tonight is, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this this is a this is a unique blend, of course, as they all are. Uh, fire consumes everything it touches. It melts steel to hone the sharpest, deadliest blade. Fire courses through the veins of House Targaryen and is made flesh in the form of its dragons. With fire in their blood, the Targaryen dragons breathe ferocious flames like a scorching blaze. They roar their verse of a song of ice and fire. That's a fancy way of saying Johnny Walker fireball. Yep. Blended scotch whiskey. Uh, peated malt, subtle smoke, rich rounded sweetness, full bodied flavor, deliver subtle red fruit, hint of spice, and a sweet smoke. Best enjoyed neat for a warm, smooth finish. So, wonderful. Yeah, that's what I got going on. Well, now that we talked about our brown, let's talk about brown. How you doing? Whiskey and whiskey. This is the darkest brown you got. Yeah. Say, Holmes, uh, where they hiding the scotch? What about, um, 
Brown. That's code for bourbon. Great stuff, this bourbon. It comes from a land called Kentucky. Talk about brown. There's a special rung in hell reserved for people who waste good scotch. Scotch? Oh, yes, I, I think so. Could I have one more of these with some booze in it, please? Today's Talk About Brown, we come to us from InsideHook.com. This is a booze section special. This one's coming from December 21st, Leon, but I held on to it because I thought it would be special. I wanted Mr. Jones to be here, and uh, this is not the first time in the episode he will disappoint us with his absence. For those of you paying attention at home, we did not introduce the vice host because he is absent tonight. We're going to blame this one on the Prince of Walnut Creek because he usually gets uh, sidelined on being a new dad, which is cool. It's on brand. This particular article is labeled the secret Scottish drinking society that's basically akin to whiskey knighthood. Meet the keepers of the cotch, the people preserving and honoring Scotch whiskey. Now, I think we've mentioned this before in the pod, Leon, but I wanted to revisit it being that it's a new year. And this is probably going to be the second season of the Bottle of Brown podcasts, mix things up. So let's revisit some of our favorites as we work our way through season two. The article begins, centuries old ritualistic drinking vessels, twice yearly meetings in a castle, a membership strictly off limits to outsiders. I love that. Scotch has its own secret, well, more like exclusive society. It's called the Keepers of the Cotch. The 2,800 members, keepers, exist to honor, protect, and uplift the legacy of Scotland's finest export. As a keeper of the Cotch, it is our job to support the society and to recognize the legacy and tradition of Scottish history and Scotch whiskey. As Aberlour master distiller Graham Cruikshank, that's a name, yeah, qualify... New keepers must have worked in the industry for a minimum of seven years, and the accolade is a recognition of their personal contribution to the Scotch whiskey industry. Thoughts on that, That's Leon? cool. Well, <clears throat> I would say any society, mostly the secret society, so the fact that we know about this disappoints me a little. But let's just say this is secret, and we're letting the secret out here. Yeah, I mean, first or second rule of Fight Club, right? Yeah, uh, of course, bitching. I, the first thing I was going to say is what qualifies. How do you get into this exclusive club? And what better way than you got to have at least seven years in the industry and contribute something before you get to come in and be part of this exclusive group, which is awesome. Boom. Awesome. Uh, so the article goes on, and this is great because it actually corrects me. First, what's a quake? A quake, sort of pronounced like a quake. It's Q-U-A-I-C-H. Quake. If you're familiar with the Gaelic. So if you're thinking about loch, which is lake, quech is a two-handled drinking cup or bowl. You can see the picture here on the webpage. We'll be hosting all these links in the show notes uh, for those of you that like to follow along. Traditionally made of wood, these shallow vessels were later crafted out of precious metals. Either way, they often featured intricate carvings and designs and eventually became more of an ornamental gift because two-handed drinking vessels are kind of awkward. They were popular in Scotland starting around the 17th century, but the vessels predate that period by hundreds, if not thousands of years. As an article in Rampant Scotland suggests, during the Celtic period, Druids filled quakes with blood from the hearts of sacrificed humans. Even Whoa. centuries later, some quakes featured glass bottoms so drinkers can keep a wary eye on companions and or enemies. Now, if that isn't metal. <laughs> But how how dangerous of an environment are they drinking in where even if you lift your, your cup for a moment, if you can't see through it, you could be killed. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm getting from that. Yep. Yeah. That's a violent, uh, violent culture. More recently, the quake represents something a little more gentle. As Cruikshank notes, it's been long associated with friendship, trust, and the enjoyment of scotch. Okay. So what are the keepers of the quake? It's a professional association. Founded in 1988. According to their website, the society recognizes outstanding achievement in those who work, write, or evangelize about Scotch whiskey by honoring them with the title Keeper of the Quick. Wait a minute. Work, write, or evangelize. You know what that means, Leon? No. If, if we stretch this bitch out seven years, we're eligible. Really? <clears throat> okay. Oh, wait, you're a bourbon guy. Do we so have to put our application you don't in get now? In. What? Why? But you can be my plus one. 
Listen, as founder James is so damn noted. famous at the end of this. Hey, listen, get, get your bourbon society and then I'll be your plus one. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have the Whiskey Winers Association. As not okay. <laughs> as founder James Espy once noted, being honored as a keeper is almost like a Scotch whiskey knighthood. Buxton offers a more pragmatic view. Essentially, it exists to acknowledge people, mainly in the drinks industry, but not exclusively, who have made a significant contribution to Scotch whiskey over a sustained period, says the author. Mostly, it is companies honoring their own, but from outside, you probably have to do a little more to get noticed. Nominations are made by the member companies and vetted by a management committee. Once in, you don't really have to do anything. It's more of a recognition of achievement. Alas, no sacrifices are secret whiskey cabals here. As Buxton adds, I don't think the society does much else other than run the dinners, which is great for networking and industry gossip, and then print a glossy magazine afterwards. So this isn't like the Illuminati or the Stonecutters. Now, given that they have an official website and the aforementioned glossy magazine, no. But it is invitation only. You can see a nice little picture here from somebody's Instagram of a very happy gentleman with his happy wife who kind of looks just like him. What do you think? You see the same thing I'm seeing here? She is the female version. Yet, you know, sometimes people say that your dog or your car is a reflection of you. Yeah. I I think, I think that is the same with your life partner that you've chosen. And this man has either married his sister or found a female version of himself. Yeah. So floor length dress, uh, short hair, or at least hair tied back glasses. He's got glasses. Facial expressions look the same, only he's got a dinner jacket with a vest and a full-on uh, kilt and uh, official Scottish ensemble. He looks better in a skirt than she does, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that traditional Scottish garb is pretty bitching. Yeah, it is. He must work out. He must work out for reals. What are the rituals? Mainly twice a year dinner held at Blair Castle in Perthshire, Scotland. And yes, we dress up says Greg Shank. In fact, we have our own tartan. It's woven from pure wool and the colors represent the main constituents of Scotch whiskey. Blue for water, gold for barley, and brown for peat. The keepers also have their own coat of arms. It's here where new keepers are introduced and a few distinguished members are honored as Master of the Quick. The latest one took place in October. It's happened more than 60 times. 60 times since 88. So wow. yeah, twice a year. Okay. A pipe band plays before and after the ceremony and after enjoying a wee drum. Newly honored keepers place their hand on a silver grand quake measuring 24 inches across. The nitty gritty for getting in. All right, here we go. This is where it gets interesting. Keepers, which number just over 2,800 from over 100 countries, must have worked in the whiskey industry for a minimum of seven years. Five masters of the quake are honored during each dinner. They must be inducted as a keeper at least 10 years prior and have made an exceptional contribution to scotch whiskey according to the drinks business and the society Mm. motto is which is gaelic for water of life forever what fucking bitching is that nailed it so are there secrets unfortunately for you there are and it's with the whiskey itself the keepers of the quaich are blessed with having access to some of the finest expressions of scotch both malt and blended whiskies and the regions are equally represented there are exclusive bottlings presented at each banquet, and that's between the keepers. Something to look forward to, Leon. Something to look forward I to. I just, I feel like we need to outdo them. Like, it's not okay that Scotland has a cooler, more exclusive group than we do. And maybe we actually have, like, Illuminati bourbon or whiskey group and we're just not aware of it because it's a secret society is there like a but statesman if, society or something yeah if there's anyone out there in the magic 49 to 50 that knows about a society like this in the u.s and knows the handshake or the password and wants to give it to me i will keep it quiet and send you a bottle of delicious something or another bottle of brown at gmail.com yeah, I mean, you got to just got to be something like the the keepers of Kentucky or something. I, I challenge you, sir. You start it. I'll be your first member. Ooh. But not Mr. Jones because he's not here. <laughs> yeah, we, well, you know, we got to if we were to have a society 
as you do. What would you like to see happen? Well, First. so the keepers of the quick uh, have, have a good thing going here. You got to have official garb, right? Got to have a mm-hmm. uniform. You got to have mm-hmm. a, a icon of membership. So uh, maybe not a two handed drinking vessel, but certainly something that signifies. So uh, like a barrel or uh, you're a little bit more familiar with bourbon than I am, but you know, what, what is the, what is the iconography of bourbon? Got to have that. And then, uh, you know, a secret handshake. All right. I, I'm going to go a little farther than that. First of all, I'm going to say mm. our garb is going to have to be overalls. Okay. No shirt. Okay. And then you have to have some facial hair, which might be hard for you, but you know, glue some on or something. Go on. And then there will be also two meetings a year. One mm-hmm. of those meetings will be similar to the all sports day event. I'm, I like it. Did you ever participate in that? I did twice, but it'll be a little bit more like beer fest than all sports ah, day with okay. different events. It's getting good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we're going to get some membership after this. This so is, uh, this is many really different events. You organize teams uh, in your membership and you compete and, uh, you know, maybe one of them is uh, taste and guess. How many points can you get? Mm-hmm. Another one would be the two-man scramble golf, where you get a stroke off for every ounce of whiskey you drink. Uh, so that way go with you're either... What's up? Got to go with the scramble. Oh, yeah, that'd be amazing. Always. That, that, that's when you have a decent golfer and a drunk. And that way you have the best score possible. You know, the, the drunk is falling out, but he got you like 40 strokes off your score. Yeah, he's the because, handicap. He's, he's carrying his weight. Yeah. <laughs> what else? What else would you like to see? A dance? Uh, obviously a dance later. Hopefully um, one of our two brothers, Pond and Uncle Francis. Yeah. Uh, they usually put on two good dances together. Yeah. I'm thinking there's a lot of really cool events you can come up with, you know, and, and make it a weekend, uh, two to three day event. And, you know, I think it could be really fun. Let's, let's, let's put a pin in this for now, but I'm ready to revisit this. This All might right, be an Leon's, entire Leon's bourbon society to keep up with the keepers of the quake. I like it. Oh, oh yeah. We'll beat them. <laughs> Everything's a competition. Everything. Ain't right. We will. <laughs> well, that wraps up talking about Brown. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get into business news. News team, assemble! Let's get down, let's get down to business. And I got news for you. Today's business news comes to us from Bloomberg. For Americans shocked by inflation, Argentines have some advice. Inflation at 40-year highs is unnerving American shoppers. Argentines learned inflation survival tactics the hard way. Now, this one's dated from December 11th, but I thought it was um, it was worth going back and holding on to because I ran into this article kind of randomly. But, you know, we're, we're facing like 7, 7.2% inflation right now. And, of course, yeah. Mr. Jones, who isn't here, has some particular opinions on inflation and whether or not it's transitory and whether or not it's here to stay. So I thought this would be an interesting little uh, walk on the wild side for many Americans. I'm honestly, I'm fascinated here because I don't know about you, but talking to anyone around here, there's a lot of panic about it. And housing is a big part of it. Well, obviously, but, yeah. But I, I'm telling you, it is, it is stout. The, the difference in inflation and yeah, I mean, we're not going to get, we're not going to get hyperinflation, like spend all of your rubles to get a pair of jeans because the money will be worth nothing tomorrow. It is, it is nasty. It is highest it's ever been. Uh, but I don't, I don't see any indicators from what I'm reading that it's, that it's going to get wildly out of control. It's going to be painful for a period of time and then we'll either get used to it or it'll start going back down. But I don't, I mean, if you looked at the market, you know, the market is well beyond correction territory. So at some point I think things will, Start evening out. Anyway, Mm -hmm. the article continues. 
For many Americans, the sudden burst of inflation that has rocked the economy has been disorienting, you think? Consumer prices had been so stable for so long in the U.S. that the population finds itself a little rusty on basic inflationary era tactics. So for some advice, we turn to people who have become experts in the art of surviving runaway inflation, Argentinians. Walk around Buenos Aires and you'll hear conversations between 18-year-old college students, 90-year-old retirees, and everyone in between about currency exchange rates, soaring prices, and strategies for coping. Of course, the 50% inflation they deal with in a typical year in Argentina, the product of decades of policy missteps that have destroyed confidence in the central bank, is far higher than the 6.8% rate that Americans are enduring. 50%? I'd never heard that before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially when they were doing that import-export lockdown. Uh, But many of the principles that shape the day-to-day habits of Argentine workers, consumers, and savers are still broadly applicable in the U.S. today. Here are the do's and don'ts they offered up for however long the inflation fever lasts. Number one, spend your paycheck right away. In a high inflation economy, money that sits in the bank is losing value. Each day, those $100 on deposit buy a little bit less. As a result, many Argentines spend their paychecks as soon as they get them, carting away weeks' worth of groceries in a single shopping trip. Even a sum of it, excess meat, chicken, and fish, will sit in the freezer for months. The practical application of this technique in the U.S., where inflation isn't quite high enough to warrant such a mad payday dash, is to expedite plans to buy big-ticket items, appliances, bicycles, furniture, cars. If you have the money to pay for that sofa now, do it. Don't leave your money resting under the couch, says Federico Pieri, 30, who works in sales in Buenos Aires. That's the worst thing you can do. Number two, borrow lots of money. And don't hesitate to borrow money to finance some of those big purchases. If you can get a loan at a rate below inflation, something that's possible for many Americans today, go for it. Inflation will make it easier to repay the loan in coming months and years. It's just like they teach in economic textbooks, says Fernando. Iglesias Moyi, a coffee shop owner, take up money at very low rates. I put myself in debt to buy the best equipment and create business opportunities. And the idea is if you're paying $200 a month on something now, in five or 10 years, if inflation keeps going up, that $200 that you still have to pay won't be the same pain as the $200 you're paying now. That's the logic behind that for those of you following along at home. It makes a lot of sense, but I got it feels like it's going dead in the face of everything Warren Buffett has been teaching us. Save, save, save. But he also says invest, 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 which... Well, invest, invest because of inflation, because as your purchasing power gets lower and lower and lower, all that money that you're saving doesn't have the purchasing power it used to have. Right. Number three, negotiate a pay raise or two. It's important to remember, Argentines say, that those old 2% wage increases you were getting each year no longer suffice. Any increase in your paycheck that's less than the 6.8% inflation rate is effectively a pay cut. Your real wage, as economists call it, is declining. Argentina's labor unions and companies negotiate annual pay raises for workers that factor in inflation. When prices rise more than anticipated, those agreements often get ripped up and the two sides go back to the negotiating table to iron out new terms. It's a powerful tool that American workers can take inspiration from, albeit one that would create angst for policymakers trying to prevent a wage price spiral. Number four, buy inflation-linked bonds. There are a few good options for savers in a high inflation economy. One of Argentine's favorite saving tricks, converting peso savings into dollars. Doesn't work in the U.S., of course. Cryptocurrencies are another favorite, but many Americans already discovered those long ago, too. Then there's inflation-linked debt. Argentine bond investors are so scarred by years of surging consumer prices that they insist the government sell its securities whose value rises in lockstep with the consumer price index. Those bonds make up almost 50% of the local debt market. In the United States, they account for less than 10% of the overall market. Demand for them is picking up, though, including among mom-and-pop investors who've begun to pile into the retail version of these securities. Try to invest in something that can at least correlate with inflation. And this is where else we were going, Leon. Buy homes and cars. Another age-old hedge against inflation is real estate, which tends to increase in value over time. Cars are also a popular savings investment among some Argentines. That option may seem a bit odd in a country like the United States, where cars tend to depreciate in value, but the short supply of automobiles around the world has recently changed that dynamic. Buy things, says Marcos Lalani, 29-year-old lawyer. There are things that will keep their value with inflation. And for those Americans really frustrated by surging prices, Lalani offers one more piece of advice. Come to Argentina 
to spend your dollars. Here, you are very rich. Interesting thoughts on what happens when you have destabilized currency rates. Everything that in this article makes a hell of a lot of sense to me. Doesn't it to you? Mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm immediately going to take this down to Triple B and tell her why I need to buy all the toys I've been putting off. Yeah, it's absolutely time to buy a car. Yeah. Oh, I, I was actually looking at those e-bikes. Mm -hmm. It'd be fun to ride around. I mean, I don't want to get exercise. That'd be crazy. So I need something yeah. to... Looks like I'm exercising and getting out. get ridiculous but, here. Yeah. Now, I was having this conversation with Uncle Polly, I think, maybe even on the first episode of the pod. It was, what are you going to do to hedge against inflation? Are you going to buy 80 pounds of garbage bags? Because they don't go bad. Mm -hmm. And you figure if inflation goes up 7%, you just save yourself 7%. And I don't think the majority of people think in those terms, but definitely the idea of get a little bit more house then maybe you think you should. You know, don't obviously don't be house poor. That's kind of a symptom of living in California. It's one of the reasons that I took off. But in terms of if it's painful now, over time you'll make more money and it'll be less and less painful. So if you think about the people in like Santa Monica who have these three million dollar, you know, tin shacks that are like a mile from the beach. Their mortgage was probably 350 bucks. You know, a lot of money back in the 60s, but what is it now? So oh, the yeah. idea of make that big purchase now, if you know that inflation is going to go up, uh, because your purchasing power will be much more worth it later. Neat you know, ideas. this was a public service announcement brought to you by a couple of drunks. So why not take it? Broken here in the Brown Bulletin, as we do with most of our best news. <laughs> I'd like you folks to note that back in December, we're the ones that talked about 5G bringing United States airplanes down. Now, all of a sudden, it's in the news. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You heard it here first. You won't get the credit, though. No, of course not. Of course not. Back in the war. <laughs> Uphill both ways. <laughs> my brother on my back. Yeah, what will uh, what will our story to our kids be? I had to go <laughs> on dial up, and I could only play video games on channel three. You don't know the pain. Back in my day, gas was four eighty a gallon. <laughs> we had gas. Yeah, no kidding. We didn't have our Uber. Cars. <laughs> This, uh, I, did have a, I did have a fun moment. I'll probably, probably save this for the parenting segment, but I did have a, a fun moment in hindsight this, uh, this afternoon. We were on a Zoom call with the Homeowners Association board. And, you know, it's a Zoom call. It's, it's live. You know, people are, you can see talking heads on the screen and you can see a, a shared screen of a, a balance sheet of how they're explaining away how they spend our HOA dues. And my nine-year-old comes up and he starts talking to me like, hey, this is live. There's no pause button. He's oh. <laughs> this is on demand, buddy. But, oh, they're uh, just not going to understand life. No, no. And you're going to probably understand this with Little Miss Do Butter is when they see commercials, it's the most amazing thing. Like, really? <laughs> you guys, you guys, they show you stuff in the store that you can go buy. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> You, that's not a good thing. Yeah, it is. I want that. Oh, fuck. No oh, commercials. Because for those of you listening at home, I cut the cord a long time ago, but I still have a dish that I can pull in local channels. That's how I watch football. And, you know, when you're watching the football game or you're watching Nora O'Donnell and 6 o'clock news, occasionally you forget to fast forward, and that's when the commercials come in. And that's when your little children who've only grown up with Netflix walk in and go, what is this? What sorcery is this? This is an advertisement, kiddo. Yeah, but you can buy that stuff? Yeah, you can. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I actually feel bad for them because they'll all, when it probably starts November 1st or right after Thanksgiving and, or Halloween, I guess. Mm. And all the commercials that start showing up about all the Christmas toys. 
those were so exciting. Like that's when, as a kid, you were like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this show to get to the commercials. I want to know yeah. about the new toys. Saturday morning cartoons, which GI yeah. Joe's we had to buy. Yeah. Yeah. They don't get that anymore. So, uh, so that and either little- do the parents, by the way. So if, if you, if, if your kid wants something specific, the tickle me Elmo of the year, you don't watch any commercials. How would you even know what it is or where to look for it? Or I, I don't know. I guess the internet Google's well, ruined a little, all of of us. a little bit of paradise lost, but not too much. Yeah. Anyway, First that wraps up business news. Let's get on to the crank file. I could look for something in the crank file. Crank file. Whatever. Today's crank file comes to us from iflscience.com. And for people who have been following the Bottle of Bound podcast, you know that I'm very enamored with this girl who runs this page. This is uh, I Fucking Love Science. And this one is a very interesting one. It doesn't have a date on it, but of course, the link will be in the show notes. Say hello to Midas, the four eared cat this is real Leon. Is stop making that face that's real that's a real thing that is a cute cat honestly a cute cat with four ears this is an alien this thing landed on earth and it's here to colonize us you know how cats look at, down their nose at us you know why cats <laughs> always perch up high like on top of the fridge so they can uh-huh. look down at you this cat has superpowers because they're not natural and like is that like a heart symbol on the, on the chest everything about this Actually, cat is it unnatural. is Everything about this cat is unnatural. Do you think that really, that's natural? I think it's unacceptable is what it is. Yeah, I agree. It's sticking its tongue out. I don't trust any animal that treats me as an equal. (laughs) The article begins. A little cat unveiled a big surprise in Turkey recently as Mm. Midas, the four-eared kitten, joined the world with a permanent melem and a heart-shaped spot on her tummy. Born astray in the family's backyard in Ankara, uh, Midas has snatched the global spotlight, earning an impressive 125,000 followers on Instagram. Her unique appearance is the result of a genetic mutation that has gifted her with a second set of ears and a jaw that never quite settled properly. But Midas is thriving in spite of her differences. Veterinarian Rasat Nuri Aslan said that her condition has no ill effects on her health and hearing, reports Reuters, and that all ear flaps, little and big, connect to the ear canal. Born with five siblings in tow, Midas immediately stood out to Canis Dosamichi, who has since adopted her into the family. We have never thought of buying a cat. We just wanted to rescue a cat from the street, and we wanted to adopt her. Hmm. A noble. Hmm. Good people. Suitably unique name for a suitably unique cat, Midas was inspired by the king with the golden touch, remembered in Greek mythology. As well as being able to turn everything he touched to gold, King Midas was famous for his donkey ears, which is where the connection between Kitty Midas first emerged. And you can find this cat all over Instagram, all over YouTube. If all that isn't enough to earn your affections, Midas is partial to showing off a white patch on her black tummy that looks just like a heart. Our girl really knows how to work the angles. Midas is by no means alone in the roll call of body parts popping up where they usually don't. In 2019, a rescue revealed one puppy, now nicknamed Narwhal, was sporting an extra tail in his head. Possibly for a future crank file. Another dog found the same year to have two mouths and one ear instead of two ears and one mouth. The second mouth contained some cracked teeth, which were removed. And after that, the pup named Toad appeared to be happy and healthy. Sometimes Mother Nature should we be concerned? Should we be concerned that mutant animals are being born? Yeah, sometimes Mother Nature has a sense of humor. Are these the signs that are mentioned in the Bible? I, uh, I don't know. That, this, this right here, this is the mark of the beast in this particular photo. <laughs> like this one, haha, that's weird. That one, you can barely see it. That one, wow. Character from Doom or, or Fortnite or something. You know what I'm finding, though? And you found this on the internet. You have mm-hmm. not met this cat personally. No, which is it's why I can't really say anything about hard. her personality. It's getting really hard to trust anything anymore because you don't even have to be a professional to video edit anymore, you know? So, I mean, this looks legit, but I'm, Mm. I think in general things on the internet, I'm just, is it real? I gotta, I gotta give Reuters some credit. I mean, Reuters is, has got a bit of a, I mean, they're not going to sully their reputation of decades of news integrity on, Oh, a four-year cat. This is where it all went down. 
So I got to say that they probably put some time into this one. This is a YouTube <laughs> video. Look at this stuffed animal in the background. It's got four ears and a heart on it too. Somebody had a custom made stuffed animal for this cat. Yeah, I mean, that's. No, that's okay. That's cat activity. That's not a robot. No, authentic Turkish accent. Be a lot cooler if it had like evidence of being able to hear a tsunami or you know earthquake or something coming. Like, okay, we need to breed these things. So the lady, the lady whose audio you probably heard is Canis Dosimeci, and I'm sure the cat probably talks to her, like uh, like that dog and. What was it uh, road trip? Hey, old man, go make me some fucking pancakes. <laughs> I bet you the cat talks to her. You better be careful. I bet that cat can hear us from here. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> it has double the hearing capacity. <laughs> we don't know what this cat's capable of. Well, good on you, Midas. Well done with your four ears. That wraps up the crank file. Leon, it's time for Because Florida. Because anything goes to Florida. Baby, let the good times roll. Because anything goes to Florida. Come on down and do your worst. Uh, points for Leon. He found this one tonight. This one comes to us from clickorlando.com. Florida Sheriff. Alts Facebook comments because too many crimes reported. <laughs> right off the bat. That's awesome. I know you don't have to read the story. It's just don't yeah. bury the lead. There it is. <laughs> Pasco County Sheriff's Office says 911 or website should be used instead. Boo. Boo. Official modes. The sub headline that has to make it real. The Florida Sheriff's Office has turned off public comments on its social media posts because authorities said too many people are reporting crimes there rather than calling 911 or submitting tips to the agency's website. The Pasco County Sheriff's Office has for years maintained popular accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, capitalizing on the popularity it gained from the A&E show Live PD and securing a copyright for the hashtag, hashtag 9 p.m. routine which is a nightly reminder for people to lock up their cars and houses, the Tampa Bay Times reported. The agency has some 300,000 followers on Facebook and about 131,000 on Twitter in a county with 583,000 residents. That's fucking impressive. Mm -hmm. In a Facebook post on Monday, Sheriff Chris Nocco, N-O-C-C-O, said they will no longer allow public comment out of fear that the agency could miss life or death information. Social media was not designed for this purpose. I don't know why. I don't know why I went to King of the Hill. Yeah, I was like, uh, wow, that is that is quite sure. a stance. Although you probably nailed his accent. Well, it just uh, seems <laughs> he seems like a very lucid and measured guy. So I don't know if I want to go straight to Hank, but uh, Sheriff Chris Nocco said in the post, "To be clear, this was not a decision we take lightly." The change was prompted after his three-member public information team began posting more social media notices about missing persons and runaway teens. These posts drew overwhelming comments from people reporting crimes and leaving tips in social media threads. Yeah, yeah, I know the guy's missing, but my house, my house has got broken into. <laughs> However, why with come, the continued... Why come is always my house? <laughs> why come, why come my car ain't in my driveway no more? I don't care about no missing people. <laughs> However, with the continued growth in our county and the need to continue to provide resources to serve our growing population, there was not a possibility to hire the people that would be required to monitor our social media platforms on a consistent 24-7 basis for 365 days a year, he said. That was a normal voice for Sheriff Knuckle. Some criticized the decision before the comments were cut off. Um, if people weren't comfortable using the other formats to leave tips before, they won't be comfortable with it now. It will just leave you with less tips, one user wrote. It's almost like you want to discourage people from providing information, another user wrote. The sheriff also noted that the unfortunate growth in negative and hurtful comments, especially directed to runaways. He said that these kinds of comments can be hurtful to those individuals and their families who are often looking for needed assistance. Imagine just for a moment if that was your loved one that has gone missing and you are desperate to find them, but... Instead of seeing help, you see a commentary asking about their upbringing, their looks, or the type of picture that was provided to law enforcement. 
Dang it, Bobby. You know, don't you, when I first read this, I was thinking this, this flies right in the face of every stereotype in Florida. One, Florida is full of nothing but old people. Old people don't use Facebook. So how are mm-hmm. there so many comments? Or Florida is full of a bunch of hilljacks that don't understand anything about technology or anything like that. So why would there be so many comments? So good on you, Florida. Good on you using current technology to tell the world to go fuck off because you do know how to use technology and you are trying to use it for good. And this sheriff shut you down. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to leave that one out there, Leon. I think that was well said. (laughs) I mean, I think you should try to collect information. Now, what I was expecting this article to say was there was a ton of misinformation or false claims or trolls. And because of that, they were spinning a bunch of wheels and resources they didn't have. So they chose to shut it down. That's not what this article said. This article said too much and not using the proper medium. And too much we don't have the manpower channels. to, to man it. Yep. All of those are unacceptable reasons to shut it down. Lucid, measured, intelligent. Yep. Uh, imagine just for a moment that it was your loved one that has gone missing and you are desperate to find them. But instead of seeing help, you see commentary asking about their upbringing, their looks, or the type of picture that was provided to law enforcement. Now, that is very Florida trollish behavior. You know, this person is missing. Yeah, well, they ugly. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of Florida got injected back into the story. So don't be too disappointed. That wraps up Florida. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get into parenting. We can make kids right now. That's why we're here. It's not the years. It's the mileage. What was the name of that guy who you wanted to add to the uh, parenting segment? I made people. Have you ever made yeah. people? Yeah. Who's that? Who's the stand-up guy? Right? All right. You go. Yeah. Um, so this one came from an interaction that I had uh, ripped from real life. There is a very, very nice uh, gay couple in our neighborhood. Uh, The portmanteau for this gay couple is Stan. So Stan have two dogs. And their two dogs could use more exercise. And my kids want a dog. So we were hanging out at a a neighborhood function. And they're like, hey, if you want to send the kids over any time to play with the dogs, just do it. And I was like, you sure? They're six and nine. Um, and they said, no, no, absolutely. Anytime. And so, all right, we tested it. We, uh, we let the kids run over there and they rang the doorbell and they played with the dogs and, you know, they ran through the house and, you know, gay men are stereotypically very clean and tidy. And so of course their house was spotless and everything had a place and there were lots of nice stuff. And they came back and they said, this is so clean, lots of nice stuff and everything was polished and dusted. I'm like, it's because they don't have you. But uh, the the inevitable conversation came up of they started asking questions. And so um, one of the guys came over and uh, had a conversation today and said, um, you know, they're asking questions that they probably need answers to. Uh, I want to make sure it's cool with you. Maybe you want to talk to them. And so we had a very interesting conversation today after school to which we said, you know, what... uh, what do you define as marriage? And do you have any questions about Stan? Do you want us to explain their scenario? And um, it was very interesting in the variety of responses we got. The six-year-old couldn't be bothered. Whatever. They got dogs. I like dogs. And that was it. Can I go? Yeah, yeah. Fuck off. The nine-year-old had that kind of immediate reaction that I guess you would that probably we would have had at his age, you know, before times had evolved of, ew, that's weird. And we said, okay, well, why? And he said, well, you know, he thought about it and he called him molded over in his head. And he went, I don't know. I said, okay, do you have any other questions? He goes, well, do they love each other? Yeah. And they live together? Yeah. And they have dogs? Yep. So when I asked one of them if he had a wife, he said, yeah. And I said, it's probably because he wanted to 
us to have this conversation with anyone. All right, so what, what do I say? So, well, they each have a husband. Okay. So I just say, your husband? Yeah. Okay. Can I go? That was it. So this conversation that uh, some people seem to dread lasted a couple of minutes, had a few quizzical looks from the nine-year-old. But at the end, he was like, whatever. I still get to play with their dogs, right? Yeah. Yeah, you do. And we like them. So nothing changes. And that was it. So I pulled up a study from Cornell University regarding uh, the whole idea of what same-sex marriages have effects on. And the Cornell University was kind of inconsistent and inconclusive, but I found another one from Australia. And this one comes to us from uh, abc.net.au. Same-sex marriage debate puts kids at risk, not same-sex parents, experts warn. So the gist of what I'm getting at is discrimination is the problem, not necessarily the thing that is being discriminated. And uh, this is kind of a heavy topic for parenting, but it, it was something that was weighing on our minds as we attempted to explain to our children that, listen, if, if two people love each other and they want to be exclusive and they want to own a house together, that's it. They're over there. They've got their, their Subaru and their Volkswagen and, and life is good. So I looked up uh, this particular article which I, I want to say something a little bit bigger than this uh, after you've had your chance to chime in, Leon. But this is what the research says. So Professor Oberclade of uh, the uh, Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Australia. This is what the research says. A 2017 review of 79 different studies concluded an overwhelmingly scholarly census that having a gay or lesbian parent does nothing in ways of harm to the children. A 2014 review of over 40 studies concluded children of same-sex couples do as well as other children across a range of measures, including academic, social, cognitive, and psychological health. A 2013 review of the Australian and international research found being raised by same-sex parents does not harm children. And a 2010 meta-analysis of 33 different studies found parents' gender or sexuality does not adversely affect child health or well-being. They found family processes such as parenting quality and parental well-being, rather than family structure, number, gender, or sexuality of parents make a more meaningful difference to children's well-being and positive development. Things like the quality of parenting, parental well-being, the ways parents relate to the child, the nurturing and stimulating qualities in the home, those factors are much more important than whether the parents are heterosexual or same-sex. What do you think of that, Leanne? <clears throat> well, now that I'm already on my second drink of barrel proof and I'm pretty deep into the show. We know where, where my head's at. So I'm trying not to, turn? yeah, I'm trying not to turn down the, the evil corner. Look, it's, it's a touchy subject. Do you remember when we were in school and we were going through sex ed you had to go, I don't know about you, but I know I had to go home and have a permission slip signed by my parent on whether or not I was allowed to or not go through that training. Do you remember that? Did, was that something you ever had to go through? I don't know if I did or not. I remember taking you the should, egg. Yeah. You should ask, uh, you should if ask your parents a, about a, that. But there was a permission slip. Yeah, there was definitely, um, and, and I, cause I remember it very clearly. I think it was around fifth or sixth grade when we went through it and, hmm. They separated out the kids that didn't get the permission slip sign versus the ones that did. And, you know, they brought up pictures of penises and vaginas and we giggled, but, you know, it's a serious thing. And here's what it oh, is. Oh, yeah, I do that remember stuff. that. And yeah, 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 yeah. The point of that is it's a heavy discussion. And at the time, it was highly debated. And Therefore, the schools figured out that, you know what, this might be something the parents want to teach their kids on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the things that you were saying to me, the things that were resonating to me, I think the most important thing was that you took it on and you addressed it with your children and you had the conversation. Mm -hmm. And where I struggle with this entire topic is especially in the parenting subject it's section is that 
it is the parents' job to have tough conversations with their kids, whatever it is, whatever the 100%. topic, because nobody knows your kids better than you do. And when is it the right time to have the conversations? And, and there are a lot of views out there, right? You, know, you take people on the left and they will say, you know, why are you being discriminatory? We should have these open conversations. You have people on the right saying, don't push these, these, your views on my child. I want to have these conversations. And neither one of them are really wrong. But at the end of the day, in the parenting section, and we're talking parent, be a parent, stop letting other, in my opinion, other people, other entities, other organizations, parent your kid for you. So, 100%. so let me start with that. The, as far as it's becoming more and more common, right? The stigma. Uh, I, I think I know one or two kids that had, you know, two moms, two dads growing up in school and you touched on it. Kids without pushing from adults or other forces my, and I, and I'm, I'm going from my views here, right? I, where I grew up, people around me, kids don't give a shit. They don't care. Adults care. They mm -hmm. don't care about this. They don't care about race. They don't care about sex. They don't care about any of that. They care about when do they get to go to recess? And did my parents pack a good lunch? And that's what they care about. And I think sometimes the important thing for us is the, the world is definitely charging very hard towards normalizing things that weren't as normalized before. So you're either on the train or you're going to fight it until kicking and screaming all, all, all the way. Right. So just take a look around. I've said this many, many times before. Stop. Take a look around. Take a breath. Don't listen to every talking head or every blog you've ever read. Just take a breath, listen to the situation yourself and, and address it that way. That's, that's all the advice I can give. I can't tell people what to believe and I can't tell people what is right and wrong. That isn't my role. I'm a drunk. Why would you listen to me anyway? <laughs> what I'm saying is take the time to at least think about it, ask the right questions and make sure that you're there for your kid when they have questions. That's it. That's all I have about this topic or any other topic that falls into this because there are, a, like I said, I maybe two or three kids that I can think of that had same sex parents and I didn't give a shit. Right. But it also wasn't a highly, it didn't feel to me like it was a, highly political, highly talked about, um, in, in your face issue. It just was what it was. And okay. Yeah, fine. Cool. You got two moms. One of them's hot. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. I, I don't so. remember any kids growing up. So to suggest that it, that's because there weren't any, it's like, well, no, it's absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. There probably could have been same sex parents growing up. Just, we didn't care. We were kids. So um, Here, here's the question though. And, and I don't really know the answer to this because kids are going to be kids and kids are going to make fun of, and that's really what you're trying to prevent, right? Not making this little, I, I think that's what the saying in the article among other things, but the child of the same sex family, right? Shouldn't be um, bullied for that. Right. But then you right. also, but then you also have to think, all kids get bullied or made fun of or whatever for a various of different things, right? Hey, your dad's car is a beater, you know, and your mom's hair looks like whatever. Yeah. We can do mama jokes for all, all day if we want to. Um, is it that much different than, you know, your, your mom has could, had to find another mom. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is, or maybe it is just to us, but is it to kids? I don't know. So I'm not the a psychiatrist. Idea of when you look at the, the statistics that suggest uh, kids grow up with mental health problems or otherwise cannot be contributing members to society if they have same-sex parentage, 
It's really the fact that the discrimination made its way into the home environment. It wasn't the discrimination wasn't there because I think you're right. I think if that's, you're going to hit that everywhere. Like I got made fun of for having a girl's name and having a uh, uh, small feet. Like the kids will fucking find anything that they can to make fun of you for. It's if that is allowed to penetrate the inner sanctum of the family. So what the article Good says reason is. reason to use the word penetrate. <laughs> Sorry. <go ahead. laughs> Equal opportunity podcast. The article yeah. goes in to say uh, children and adolescents with same sex parents are emotionally affected when they and their families are exposed to homophobia, discrimination, prejudice, and social stigma. And so it's not so much that these things exist because they do. It's whether or not they are allowed inside the sanctity of the home environment. So the reason that this particular article struck me as I was trying to do research on this topic is this doesn't just apply to uh, gender bias and uh, sexual orientation. This, this kind of goes beyond. And mm-hmm. I think what happens is if you can try as much as you can to prepare and or shield your kids from it to an age at which they're ready to engage it with some level of clarity, that to me is good parenting techniques. So you're not going to avoid it. You're not going to pretend it isn't there. You're simply going to address it as needed at the level that they are willing to accept it, which was kind of the experience that I had today. And this got me thinking about a bunch of other things that I've run into recently. Uh, One is my favorite quote from Dennis Leary. Uh, And this is not homophobia or sexual discrimination, but it's, it's racism. He says, racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. I have a two-year-old son. You know what he hates? Naps. End of list. And that is one of my favorite quotes from Leary, you know, other than the cows and the otters that Leon and I like to joke about from time to time. But this mm-hmm. to me was poignant because the kids only know what we teach them. And so just like when kids kind of mirror behaviors that we don't like, if you have anger management issues or if you say yes too much, the kids are going to pick up on that. So if you see your child doing something that you don't like, you really want to turn it around and say, am I exhibiting this behavior? Because they're always watching you. So if you don't Mm -hmm. want to raise discriminating kids, you don't want to introduce discrimination or judgment to them. And uh, I want to close this segment, Leon, with a quote from psychologist, Dr. Emily Anhalt. Um, With regards to the nature versus nurture paradigm, she says that nature loads the gun, nurture pulls the trigger. Mm. Ah. So be very, very cognizant of what you let into your conversations with your kids because they're always watching. Yeah. That wraps up parenting. Let's get on to Leon Lowe's. So far, Danny, I haven't heard a single logical reason. No, no, don't accept this. It's frustrating. And we haven't cured cancer. We have not cured cancer. I don't know the answer. I'm just ranting about it. Leon, floor is yours. Danny, I want to talk about the Hall of Fame. Oh, get in there. Any talk Hall about, of Fame. Talk about Roger and Barry. Roger and Barry are the reason I'm bringing it up today. But the entire Hall of Fame process, football, baseball, golf, ah, whatever it is. Preach. All of them. What is I got to ask you a couple. This is an interactive love because it's important. <laughs> Ah, multimedia load. All right, let me press yeah. the screen. It's important. And I was hoping Mr. Jones would be here. And I know he is really going to regret not being here for this because he I'm has sure he's on baseball. Yeah. Many opinions on baseball and since this came out. And I would like to first start. I don't I don't know that either one of them belongs in it. And I'm not advocating for that at all. But what I am saying is the system is rigged and fucking broken. And We've just kind of stood for it. What do you think, Danny? What is the point of the Hall of Fame? What's the point? Uh, The Hall of Fame is to recognize outstanding achievement in a particular vocation, whether it be sports or art or other. So there's a a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, for example. So what's the the definition of outstanding? 
Um, that's a good question. I would say above and beyond the benchmark or the average, or certainly when records are broken. So, so there we are, right? So we have records and we have data and we know who hit the most home runs mm -hmm. and we know who has the most touchdowns and the most passing yards and the most soccer goals and most hits in hockey and the most goal saves or mm -hmm. we know that that is regularly available so much that when you watch any TV program, they are giving you the most ridiculous fucking stats as you're watching it. Like, Oh, that's the most passes Aaron Rodgers has ever thrown in a rain uh, when it was below 38 degrees. Like, how do they know that? I don't know. They just keep it on everything. So if that's the case, why do we have the hall of fame? Because we have, it should just be data driven, right? If you did X, if you achieved Y, then you go in. That's it. That's how you get in. But it isn't that. It's this discretionary, and you kind of touched on it because based on whatever. And then you also said hitting home runs or you know hitting whatever records. But baseball specifically, and I'm picking on baseball because this just happened and this is what it's fresh. We have one person. That's right. One person this year that's going to make it into the hall of fame for baseball mm -hmm. is a class of one and they're allowed to vote up to 10. Right. And I say, they, who votes for baseball? Do you know? Yeah. It's sports writers association. Sports fucking writers. Yeah. Why do sports writers have the authority to decide who gets into the hall of fame? Who the fuck are they? Who do you think it should be? I, it, it's either two things. It's either the fans or it's the players mm. because that's where I'm getting at. I like the that. hall of fame should be a recognition of you're performing for me, the consumer, or you need to be recognized by your peers who are doing it in the rule sets that were given to them at the time, right? Rules change every year. Things like get it. harder, games get longer. I like and it. then they understand at the time that this was a spectacular person in my sport. I fucking hated this guy or gal. I hated him, but you know, they achieved something special and I want to recognize them for it. That's who should be voting. Fucking sports writers. Who gives these people the authority to say that you're good or not? Why? Cause I write about you that I, it's it's insanity. It's insanity that we've stood for this long that these people get to choose who we remember for eternity because there's some kind of authority on it. The real authorities are the viewers or the players. I am. I would like to err on the side of the players. Yeah, the I would Hall say of Fame should be for the players so that we go in and say the players, the people who did it, the people who sloshed in the mud and did practices and 162 games or whatever. These are the people I respect enough to make a actual vote that means something and put these people in so that they're recognized. And then it would mean something to me because now for me to go to, uh, you know, any of these hall of fames and look at them and go, Hmm, this is, this is a person that a bunch of writers thought was important. I don't give a shit about that. That's not yeah, important it's very to difficult me. to evaluate under that view. Right. So this whole argument of should or should not Roger Clemens or Barry Bonds get in uh, or, you know, do they qualify? It doesn't matter to a bunch of old crotchety men that, you know, want to hold on to the legacy of the game and can't let it go. And <laughs> some people say, Hey, you know, they'll age out and the younger group will come in and they'll vote them in. And it, it, all of that still doesn't matter. I don't respect their opinion. And why the fuck should I? And that's where I'm struggling with the Hall of Fame. All of the Hall of Fames. Let the players within a, you know, the retired ones and the current ones that have ever played in a section of time. They're the ones that get to vote best players in this time period move on and give them the criteria you have to you have to meet these minimum requirements to even be on the ballot you can't even be on the ballot unless you do that so there's a little bit of an analytical you have to meet a certain threshold which would make it amazing for a lot of these players like yes i've done it 
I've reached the threshold where I qualify to be in the Hall of Fame. And if my peers like me enough, I get to be in. That's where it should be. That's my fucking two cents. It is ultra painful that it becomes a popularity contest because that's not the definition of Hall of Fame. Now, the right. irony is that the words Hall of Fame, fame is, is a measure of popularity, which is a shame. It's the Hall of Success, the Hall of uh, Completions, the Hall of Greatness. I mean, there, there's lots of other things you could call it, but the Hall of Fame is what we have. And so fame determines that. But I, I agree 100%. Why, why do writers, uh, for the same reason that football standings are done by the AP poll, why, why do writers all of a sudden have all of this power as if there's not people playing the game or people watching the game and writers to me, and, and I am a writer, so I'm, I'm fucking shitting on my own. Writers are a function to encourage the business of watching and paying for the game. Mm -hmm. So they are tools of the establishment to increase activity. Why do they get a say in what the activity did? Because it's neither the server or the beneficiary of that activity. So a hundred percent there, Leon. With that being said, should we indulge in the actual selection? Because the only one that I have any issue with is Clements. And I want to tell you why. Issue not getting in is Clements? Yeah. Um, there are guys like Andy Pettit that got in trouble. He may or may not make it in. There are guys that, if you look at, uh, if you look at the key problem with steroids, the steroids are a measure of strength, and so something that requires a lot of strength. I don't think Rogers in trouble because he threw a faster uh, fastball. I don't think Rogers is is in trouble because his curveball dropped an extra inch and a half. I think Rogers in trouble because steroids helped him heal, and that was the same thing with Andy Pettit. So I wonder if pitching. Although, you break the rules, you break the rules. I wonder if pitching should be separate from hitting. Because in the case of hitting, everything is about power. Steroids mm -hmm. make you stronger. You swing the bat faster. The physics of it, the mass of the baseball is the same. The speed of the baseball is the same. And yet you have the mental acuity to whip that bat around faster such that you can crack and make the ball go farther. So steroids, by their very purpose, is to increase muscle mass to allow you to be faster. Is it equivalent to say Sammy and Barry? Sorry, guys. Roger used it to heal. Do we still lump them in the same category? First of all, baseball specifically and this is an opinion of mine, and this is where I know Mr. Jones would just jump in all over it, but I think one of the most difficult things to do in all of sports is to hit a round ball and a round bat that's moving sideways up and down at the same time uh, and coming at you at Mach 10. I just don't think there's anything harder. Yep. Uh, if your body is stronger, you probably will hit it farther. If your body is taking drugs that people aren't, other people aren't allowed to, you'll recover faster. Is it cheating? Yes, it's cheating. It is cheating. It was defined as cheating, and so it's cheating. Uh, do I think that they should still be in? I do. I do. I don't think that what they took is what made them great. I think they were great, and they took it to get even better because their Ooh. level of competition in their brain is I got to keep getting better. I'm getting older. The younger kids are coming in. I got to get better. I'm getting, you know, things are hurting. I can't get the speed I used to get. Um, so I think that they were already great. They didn't need to take it to get to another level. They would have been there anyway. It just would have maybe taken them longer or maybe they would have gotten injured and injured out. Who knows? Uh, so, yeah, so then it's a question of how long. So we were we yeah. were talking about this with Lance Armstrong. How long? Right. And there's a suggestion right. that the testicular cancer of Lance Armstrong was once it started. So mm -hmm. I don't think he got it before all seven. Yeah, I don't I don't know. 
And we'll have, look, we'll have to look into that. And I get it. You know, once you cheat, you cheat, you're out. You're not in, right? And that's right. a discourager. Cheating, cheating, want cheating is a one way street, right? They tell you, you know, you if you want a one way ticket out of the Hall of Fame, cheat. You know, that's the message you're trying to send. And again, who's they? And you nailed it. I think we get a little too caught up. I know words matter, words matter, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the Hall of Fame, you defined it exactly what everybody really thinks it is. It's not who's the most famous, right? It's who's the best. Who is the best of the best? And that's what it's supposed to be, regardless of the name. But that's all what we think it is, right? If it really is the Hall of Fame, and then you better put fucking Barry Bonds in there, Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco, Sammy Sosa, Roger Clemens, Alex Rodriguez, all of those people need to be in there because like it or not, they made baseball, which wasn't that interesting, interesting. Yeah, so and, extra points for that. McGuire yeah. and, and Sosa absolutely revived the game. And that to mm-hmm. me is they, from, from a business standpoint, from a fan standpoint, you know, whether or not those guys were – uh, cheating in the sense of going against the rules, they brought people back to the game. And there's a very fair argument that could be made of maybe the game would have gone away if they had not. And that to yeah. me is grounds for admission to the hall. If for that reason right. only. It's who made the biggest impact on the sport, right? right? Again, like define what the fuck the hall of fame is and will help us with the debate on who belongs in there. No one's defined it. We don't even know what the hell it is. It's just a bunch of people that sports writers decided are important enough to put in there. Yeah. And we just and the go, great oh. tragedy. The great tragedy of that is it's either you did or did not. And I look yeah. at highlights of Barry Sanders now. Barry Sanders in his prime would rip the shit out of the league today. There's right? just, there's no comparison. So how, how do you, I mean, how do you measure that? There are people going to be talking about that for decades. How do you marry, how do you, how do you measure Bo Jackson, right? The guy was an incredible ball player. Yeah. Switch hitter. Oh, and by the way, play football like a fucking rock star. Where do you put him? There's no hall of fame for him, but I promise you everyone tuned in when he was on because that was important. So, well, the good part about it is I think you nailed it is the, the writers that are punishing them now with non-admission the thing about this that I think people that are getting their blood boiled up don't understand is the rules can always be changed. There can always be <laughs> retroactive inductions. And so say 10 years from now, the old cranky guys that say steroids ruin the sport, they're retired, they're gone. A new crop of writers come in and they go, wait a minute, look at the stats. The numbers don't lie. You know, I, fucking Roger Maris got an asterisk by his name because some rules were changed and Roger didn't cheat. Roger was playing the game that was presented to him. And I remember an old guy named Albert, who I used to know, who's no longer with us. Albert said, well, it was legal at the time. You're going to punish right. somebody for, for operating under the rules? Yeah, you changed the rules. It's no longer legal. But at the time, you know, well, whose and that's, fault is that, it? That's the point. It's at the time, right? And as a society, we do it constantly. We punish people for things that are unacceptable now that they did in the past. And you can't put yourself in those shoes, but you know who can? The athletes that were doing it at the time. You know, I find it hilarious. The ones that are sitting up in the warm booth, you know, that flew in on fucking first class to get in there are commenting on whether or not Roger Clemens, who spent the last four days in an ice bath trying to get his arm ready to go, just fucking, you know, doing everything he can to make his body eat what he's got to eat. You know, you went out last, you, you know, Mr. Fucking sports writer, you had a filet mignon last night. He had a kale salad because he's got to drop a couple pounds. Like, and then you go, you know what? I don't think you should be in it. I, I don't. Who the fuck are you? What have you ever done? Except for just bitch about me. So yeah, I'm struggling with the whole, the whole subject in general is it makes it lose credibility to me. And 
it makes it worthless for me to go visit or be impressed. I'm not, I'm not impressed. I think that's so, true. I think it, it, it lessens the value of the award based on who is bestowing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Well done. All right, Mr. Jones, you'll have to listen to that one. And, right. uh, and he's and, kind of, and call in on the line that Danny has, and we will play your message back on later shows since you couldn't make this one. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the <laughs> ceiling, which needs to be cleaned and sterilized, so you get nothing. Good day, sir. <laughs> Is All right, there. let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, finish up the rest of the bottle here. Uh, this bitch is empty. Yeet! Little bottom of the bottle wisdom here. <laughs> Leon, did you know the three most painful places to get stung by a bee are the nostrils, the upper lip, the upper lip, and the penis shaft? Oh. first of all, good things to know. Uh, all of those made me cringe just by you saying them. So I, I agree with all of those. Next time you see a beehive, pull your pants up. <laughs> you pervert. What are you doing with your pants down by a beehive? <laughs> that is our show. Thank you to all the Bobs for joining us. We understand that your numbers are growing and we love it. If you like the show, please follow and subscribe on your favorite platform. If you listen to us on Apple, Google, Stitcher, Audible, Spotify, uh, please give us a five-star rating because that allows others to be able to see the show and we can increase our listenership. We can add more Bobs to our community. If you want to contact us, you can email us at bottleofbrown at gmail.com. You can also give us a call at 602-529-4562. We will play your voicemail on the show. That wraps it for for this episode. We did not have Mr. Jones join us. We tried many times to get him to jump on the show, but sadly, we were without him tonight. Hopefully, he'll be back next time. And uh, that does it for us, Lynn. Final thoughts? I have none. I'm not thinking anymore. I'm too deep in this bottle. And it was a good bottle, wasn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. That's all for tonight, folks. You can join us next time. Same brown time, same brown channel. Bottleofbrown.com. This place is dead anyway, man.